The foundation of learning is reading. I don't know a smart person who doesn't read and read all the time. The problem is, what do I read? How do I read? Because for most people, the struggle is a chore. So the most important thing is just to learn how to educate yourself. And the way to educate yourself is to develop a love for reading. Read what you love until you love to read. Until you love to read. Read what you love until you love to read. Read what you love until you love to read. Everybody I know who reads a lot loves to read. And they love to read because they read books they loved. It's a little bit of a catch-22, but... You basically want to start off just reading wherever you are and then keep building up from there until reading becomes a habit. And then eventually you will just get bored of the simple stuff. You may start off reading fiction, then you might graduate to science fiction, then you may graduate to nonfiction, then you may graduate to science or philosophy or mathematics or whatever it is. But take your natural path and just read the things that interest you until you kind of understand them and then you'll naturally move to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Read what you love until you love to read. Read what you love until you love to read. Read what you love until you love to read. Read what you love until you love to read. Yes, that's true. As Bowser, the Chinese philosopher, said, the highest virtue is not virtue, and therefore really is virtue. But inferior virtue cannot let go of being virtue, and therefore is not virtue. Translated in more of a periphrastic way, the highest virtue is not conscious of itself as virtue or really is virtue. The highest virtue is not conscious of itself as virtue. And therefore, therefore, as virtue. Lower virtue is so self-conscious that it's not virtue. That it's not virtue. Virtue is so self-conscious that it's not virtue. That it's not virtue. In other words, when you breathe, you don't congratulate yourself on both virtues. But breathing is a great virtue. virtue.
But this question of the non-human intelligences is very, very much on the agenda. All shamans in all times and places have claimed this. The thing that so pleases me about DMT is, you know, a lot of people will not take a psychedelic like LSD or psilocybin or something because it lasts hours and hours. Inevitably, a thing lasting that long, you're going to end up dealing with your stuff. Your, your, this and that. A lot of people don't care for that sort of thing. With DMT, it lasts four minutes. And so how lost in an examination of childhood trauma can you get in four minutes, especially when you have hundreds of elves tugging at your coat sleeves? It's really an incredibly powerful tool. We have the UFO people claiming there are non-human intelligences, but they have no reliable method of contact that works for a skeptic. The great thing about DMT is it doesn't require belief. service announcement for uh, for the war it was a, a plea for for parents to uh, to allow their children to know that they would do everything they could to keep their children safe because that's what children would be concerned about there was all of this stuff on television about people getting killed and, you know, people in the direst of straits with visages that were tortured. And I understand that. I mean, I understand why that, that would need to be 
shown. But if children happen to see that, they could be frightened terribly. So, in fact, news programs are probably the most frightening programs for anybody. What I wanted the parents to know were, was that the, invariably, when children see something like that, their first thought will be, what will happen to me? So, you know, whether we could be absolutely sure of this fact or not, we need to say it. I will take care of you. We need to say it. man 
who knows the inner secret. He's seen through the game. And he finds it by going away alone into the forest and cutting himself off from the tribe. That is to say, from social conditioning. And he goes maybe for a long period into the forest and comes back. He's found out who he is. And he sure isn't who he was told he was. But as hunting cultures settle into agrarian patterns of life, what do they do? They build a village. And around the village they set up a stockade, which is known as the Pale. And the village is always, of course, standing at crossroads. And there you get in an agrarian society a division of labor. And the division of labor comprises four. In medieval Europe, we call them Lords Spiritual, Lords Temporal, Commons, and Serfs. In India, they are Brahmins, Kshatriya, that means fighters, Vaishya, merchants, traders, Shudra, laborers. So you've got the priests, the warriors, the merchants, and the laborers. Division of labor. The four sections of town. So the four basic castes. So when you are born, you are born into a caste. And uh, your duty as a grihasta or householder is to fulfill your caste function and to bring up a family. When you've done that, you go back to the forest. Back to the hunting culture. And you drop your role. And you become nobody a shaman again. So a Hindu calls one who does this a shramana, which is of course the same word as shaman. And the Chinese call him a xia, but a shaman is an immortal. Why immortal? Because it's only the role that's mortal. The big front, the persona. The one who you really are, the common man, that is to say, the man who is common to us all, which you could call the son of man. That's the real self. That's the guy who's putting on the big end. And of course, he has no name. Nobody can put the finger on it. Because you can't touch the tip of the finger with the tip of the finger. So there's a line in the New Testament where Christ says that no one comes to the Father except through Him. Which is a hell of a thing for anyone to say. I am the way and the truth and the life. That's another one. Here's the idea. It's as if there's a spirit at the bottom of things that is involved in the bringing to being of everything. People talk about evolution as a random process. That's not true. The mutations are random, but the selection mechanisms are not random. What are the selection mechanisms? Human females are very sexually selective. That's why you have twice as many female ancestors as male ancestors. So the male failure rate for reproduction is twice that of the female. How is it that males succeed differentially? Females reject. They reject on the basis of what? And the answer is, well, it's something like competence. How is competence defined? While men put themselves in hierarchies and they vote on each other's competence. Let's say you decide to follow the best leader in a battle. Well, then you don't die. Like, he might get all the women, but you don't die, so at least you're still in the game. And it might be the same if you're following the greatest hunter. And the greatest hunter wouldn't be the person who was best at bringing down the game. It would be the person who was best at bringing down the game and sharing it and organizing the next hunt and all of that. What that means to some degree is that there's a spirit of masculinity shaping the entire structure of human evolutionary history. That's what that means. It's the spirit of positive masculinity. 
that manifests itself across epochal ages, millions of years perhaps, and it actually has shaped our consciousness. Actually, it's like the essential spirit of all the great men who defined what greatness constituted. That's a spirit. Well, that's a purely biological explanation. Well, that's God. God is the highest value, highest value. in the hierarchy of the values. God is how we imaginatively and collectively represent the existence and action of consciousness across time. God is that which selects among men in the eternal hierarchy of men. God is that which eternally dies and is reborn in the pursuit of higher being and truth. We don't understand the world. Like, I do think the world is, is more like a musical masterpiece than it is like anything else. And things are oddly connected. Now, you know, I, that sounds new agey and it sounds metaphysical. I'm saying bluntly that this is speculative, right? I'm feeling out beyond the limits of my knowledge. I, I, I dismiss the mysterious. The mysterious. I'm not willing to dismiss the mysterious. I've experienced the mysterious in a variety of different ways. And it's very mysterious. Very mysterious. We certainly know that we're bounded by ignorance, and there's far more going on than we know or can know. We do. The problem is, is when you start to speculate, it's a projection of your imagination. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, because knowledge advances through projection of imagination. But the problem is, you can see yourself reflected back at you and then it's self-fulfilling and so you can see what you want the mysterious the mysterious i'm not willing to dismiss the mysterious
fish cry in all the water is their tears. I listen to the water on nights I drink away. And the sadness becomes so great. I hear it in my clock. It becomes knobs upon my dresser. It becomes paper on the floor. It becomes a shoehorn, a laundry ticket. It becomes cigarette smoke climbing a chapel of dark vines. It matters a little. Very little love is not so bad, or very little life. What counts is waiting on wall. I was born for this. I was born to hustle roses down the avenues of the dead. I was born for this. I was born to hustle roses down the avenues of the dead. I was One of the things I tend to do is to look at symbolic representations through the lens of evolutionary biology rather than assuming that these reasonations are mere superstition that play no functions like we hate the idea there's a deity father-like so it's a disembodied spirit in some sense that's eternal that has eternal character it's like okay well strip it of its metaphysics if you strip it of its metaphysics and just look at it as a biological phenomena. It's like, well, what might the idea that there's a, an eternal, eternal spirit, spirit of the Father, spirit of the Father. There's a, an eternal, eternal spirit, spirit of the Father, spirit of the Father. There's a, an eternal, eternal spirit, spirit of the Father, spirit of the Father. There's a, an eternal, eternal spirit, spirit of the Father, spirit of the Father. What might that be a reflection of? Well, it's like, well, there's you imitating your father, but your father imitated his father and his father and his father and his father imitated his father, 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 father. The thing is that we have been educated to use our minds in a certain way, a way that ignores or screens out the fact that every one of us is an aperture through which the whole cosmos looks out. Every one of us is an aperture through which the whole cosmos looks out.
experience predicated from actually doing the work. If you're not working on your craft, if you got too fancy to keep doing your thing, you lose. That's why I love comedians that still go to small clubs. Seinfeld, in his prime, just going to bullshit clubs in the middle of America and working on his craft. It's dirt. It can never get too fancy to get away from what got you there in the first place. That's how people lose. Crowds and dirt. I love the fucking clouds and dirt. Clouds, dirt. Clouds, I love the fucking clouds and dirt. Clouds and dirt. Clouds, dirt. Clouds, dirt. Dirt, 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 I think the most accessible form for most people is music. And music, to me, is the most representational form of art because I think that the world is made out of patterns. patterns, patterns, patterns. And we perceive some patterns as objects, but fundamentally it's patterns. And what you want is all the patterns of the world to interact harmoniously in something where every element is related intelligibly to every other element. And I think that when your life is in harmony, then you can feel that. When you're dancing to beautiful music, you're acting that out. The music is the music of the spheres and you're participating in the patterning of your being in accordance with that structure. And that gives you an intimation of, of transcendence. Music is everything. It's not criticizable. That's the thing that's so lovely about it is even as our society has become more cynical and more self-destructive and more deconstructionist, the power of music has in fact grown. because it speaks to that eternal harmony. And the reality of that eternal harmony in a way that, that mere intellect cannot deny. And I mean, I was always amused. I went to this show, uh, The Ramones, a punk band from New York. It was the loudest concert I'd ever heard by, by a good factor of 10. My ears rang for like three days afterwards and there were all these like nihilistic, nihilistic punk rockers all crammed into this theater and below me there was a mosh pit, it was like ants on a frying pan and they were just smashing into each other and throwing people around up above them and it was quite rough and they were all having this beautifully transcendent musical experience which belied all of their nihilism and they absolutely survived off. And it was like even the lyrics were harsh and nihilistic, but it didn't matter because the music in its rough form was something that united them in the sense of this like patterned beauty and brought them together. And so exposure to music, people die without music. It's like music is everything. Music is everything.
heroes.